Our special speaker today is uh, Yelena Shiet. Uh, she is a doctoral candidate at the University of Szeged uh, in Hungary and its program conservation ecology. Her expertise is on true bugs, heteroptera of Central and Southeast, Southeastern Europe, their fauna, ecology, and conservation. Yelena cur currently participates in and runs several national and international projects related to biodiversity research and conservation in and the neighboring Balkan countries. Her NGO engagement involves crowdsourcing biodiversity data in Serbia and the popularization of nature conservation and entomology among citizen scientists. She is also interested in invasive and alloctonous true bugs, their spreading patterns, and their ecological importance. Everyone, let's all welcome Yelena. Yelena? Thank you. Uh, so should I uh, start with my presentation? Like your colleague actually mentioned, my name is Yelena Shat, and I'm from Serbia. Uh, but I'm a PhD student and a candidate in Hungary at the University of Szeged. And here I will present actually uh, data from my NGO project in Serbia for the past six years, I think. So uh, these projects were dealing with true bugs in Central European saline grasslands. Just to say a few words to Heteroptera. It's a suborder, uh, one of four suborders of Chemiptera ordo. Uh, and those uh, true bugs are worldwide present with uh, over 40,000 species. In Europe, we have around 3,000 species. And in Serbia, around 850 species are present. In Hungary, the similar number of species is also recorded. Uh, true bugs are actually a very thermophilous species, a group of species. And the center of their diversity is actually in tropics. So we have uh, just a slightly uh, not so diverse um, uh, fauna here in Europe. But uh, in open and warm habitats like um, uh, grasslands, they are uh, very diverse and very numerous. This group is also uh, one of the heavy metabolic groups. So they have um, several nymphon stages during their development. And the ecological needs of actually those. Uh, nymphs are very similar to the adults. The only difference is um, that uh, nymphs don't have a, uh, developed wings like adults and they cannot move and disperse that uh, widely. Also some uh, morphological uh, peculiarities actually of true bugs that they have a hemielytron. So half, uh, half of the wing is, uh, wing is actually, or four wings are actually thickening and the rest of the wing is uh, membranose. Also, meso, mesopteron, um, sorry, mesonotum of, um, of true bugs is uh, triangle shaped and it's settled uh, between uh, four wings. Uh, true bugs are also um, recognizable by their scent glands. And you know about some groups are called also stink bugs. So uh, those are secretion of those uh, scent glands. Uh, these insects also have a rostrum as a typical mouth pair system for feeding on, um, feeding on um, uh, liquid food. Uh, so they are sucking, in the case if they are herbivor herbivorous, they are sucking plant sap or plant juices. And if they are pred predators, they are mostly fed on the liquid tissues of their prey. So these uh, insects are uh, highly ecologically diverse. They can be found in any kind of aquatic or terrestrial habitats. And they also can be found in all continent, continents except Antarctica. Also, just to emphasize that more than two thirds of true bug species um, uh, identified are actually in, in, in the world are actually herbivores. Just a few uh, information about the saline grasslands. Uh, they belong to much uh, much broader uh, Eurasian steppe. Uh, this uh, Eurasian steppe belt uh, spread from from, uh, from Hungary on west to China on east, and this belt is uh, long, almost uh, eight thousand kilometers. 
So this was the most part, this was the most part of Eurasian stuff is uh, actually settled in uh, this Pannonian plain or Great Hungarian plain and in which center is the Hungary. And we have, uh, we can see that my country, Serbia, just by its uh, northernmost part belongs to this uh, biogeographical uh, region. And by this um, green square, you can see the, where is the Central Europe situated and in its uh, southern and, and eastern north part is also Pannonian region. Just to, uh, to say a few words about the soils, saline soils actually in this region, in Serbia, in northern Serbia, like in Hungary, you can see those spots of uh, pink and violet spots are representing salt soils. Those soils are very close to big rivers and uh, they are enriched by those salts, those, re those areas and those soils are enriched by salts by those big rivers because um, areas with saline soils are actually uh, former flood zones of big uh, rivers. And those are in those, de those depressions, floods and the water stayed for the longest and the salts from surrounding mountains are deposited. So, <clears throat> those, those saline habitats in general are recognizable by its typical microtopography. So we have, according to uh, micro relief in these habitats, we have uh, different concentrations of water and salts. So we can see in, on those pictures on the left, actually how in the, on the lowest parts of the habitat, we are depression, we have the highest concentration of salts and different, the most sparse vegetation and how we are elevating this uh, microtopography, uh, we can see the changes in vegetation zones. And on the top, we have the lowest concentration of salts and lower con uh, lowest moisture. And we have um, different type of vegetation on the top of those uh, small hills, so let's say. Uh, difference in elevation in this case, for example, in those pictures is maybe just 20 centimeters. So we can see how a very fine uh, zonation is present in those habitats. Also uh, interesting for those habitats that they can change, they are very dynamic in the sense that uh, in one part of the season, this habitat can be, uh, can be marshland almost, but just a few weeks later, when uh, uh, weather and seasons start to be more drier and warmer, that those marshlands, uh, those waters from marshlands evaporate, so it becomes a almost, um, almost, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a totally dried out. So this habitat totally dried out, and it becomes uh, becomes something like a desert-like habitat. So it was interesting for me to to see to explore how actually those uh, dynamic changes in vegetation and habitat influence true bug communities and how, especially because most of those true bugs are um, herbivorous and how they respond, how those herbivorous insects respond to vegetation changes and species, uh, plant species changes in presence uh, in those habitats. Also, those habitats are recognized as a conservation priority in European Union. Uh, as I said, they have a very specific ecological conditions present here, but also they are restricted geographically to just Pannonian region in, um, in Europe and uh, very specific plant species mostly uh, are present here. Most of them are uh, Pannonian and steppe endems, endemics. This is the formal name of this set of habitats. Like I said, uh, saline habitats uh, uh, involves the whole spectrum of different habitat types, several grassland types, several marshland types, and also uh, saline or soda lakes. Those are uh, uh, represented on this picture. Those are very shallow, highly concentrated uh, lakes in, in the Pannonian plain. And you can see and observe on the surface of the soil, how crystals of salt actually stayed on the surface of the soil when the water evaporate and link shrink during the uh, season. Uh, just to say that um, a, few, a few words about the um, European Union documents uh, dealing with nature conservation and uh, species conservation and protection. Those are habitats directive. 
and birds directive habitats directive is actually the, gives the list of um, around 200 different habitat types in Europe which are protected in European Union and also more than 1000 species of invertebrates different uh, all vertebrates except uh, birds and also it involves plant species which are protected in the European Union. My country unfortunately is not part of European Union but we uh, want to be a member uh, soon and we uh, still take care about those um, uh, legal documents uh, related with uh, nature protection and nature conservation in uh, European Union. And birds directive is dealing only with the um, bird species present on European uh, wild bird species uh, present in European uh, continent. So how those uh, saline grasslands are actually uh, used uh, traditionally uh, because of those poor soil qualities, like I said, uh, high concentration of water and salts, uh, especially and uh, sometimes uh, total unavailability of water and moist in, uh, in the, those soils, they made them not, uh, not appropriate for intense agriculture. So usually those areas and those grasslands were used as low productive pastures. They were grazed by and still are grazed uh, traditionally by um, local breeds of uh, cattle, local breeds of sheep. And this is the most appropriate type uh, way how to manage those grasslands. So they have a some kind of semi-natural origin. They were never intact. So for millennia, they were firstly grazed by wild grazers and later domesticated grazers take that role. Uh, but at the beginning of 20th century, we have a uh, development, uh, development of intensive uh, agriculture in this region. So the whole landscape um, starts to develop, the whole uh, landscape change um, uh, drastically. And now we have uh, those uh, saline grasslands highly fragmented and they are represented only as a patches in mostly agrarian uh, landscape. And we lost many of those uh, saline grasslands uh, during that process, but some of the most uh, wettest, the, the, the most wet and the saltiest parts and patches are actually remained nowadays. What are the main treats to, to those habitats? Actually draining of water um, is the big problem because if we don't have a, that fluctuation in uh, water and soils in uh, water and salts in those um, soils, we are losing the also specific vegetation, which is adapted to, the, to those envir uh, environmental conditions. Also in the past problem was liming and fertilizers because people try to improve the quality of those soils, but it was never almost successful. Um, uh, then overgrazing, um, by itself, it's not a problem, but the problem is that actually uh, huge uh, deposits of uh, dung of the grazers uh, can cause uh, nitrification uh, of the soils, and in that sense, they can um, improve a proliferation of invasive plants, and in that sense, uh, changing natural and, uh, I mean, originally occurring uh, vegetation. As I said, those poor quality soils are considered as useless during the history. So they're uh, usually used in, especially in those uh, more wet parts as a, for fish uh, to, uh, to, sorry, to install and to make fish ponds for in fishery and fish production. And also they're used as a, unfortunately sometimes as a landfills and dump sites. Sometimes also wildfires can uh, can cause the degradation of local vegetation, saline vegetation, and there are several other, but those are the most important actually threats. So what is the conservation significance of these saline grasslands and uh, saline habitats in general? Like I mentioned, this is the westernmost part of Eurasian steppe here in Europe, and we have a very important and conservation important uh, for conservation important species uh, which represent a steppe biome but also some Pannonian and local endemics and as I mentioned also this area and this region is highly fragmented and mostly agricultural so those portions and those patches of semi-natural habitats are important to preserve local biodiversity. So what is the importance of true bug uh, conservation and research? 
So like I said, true bugs are very uh, abundant and very present and very diverse in saline grasslands and they can uh, represent in some set, sense total insect diversity also. And by their community composition and the uh, structure of their fauna, they can also give us information about the vegetation and heterogeneity of a habitat. So how we started um, on our projects and on this research on uh, true bugs from saline habitats. We have just some uh, scarce historical data, mostly collected by um, Dr. Geza Horvat, Hungarian heteropterist who actually work on the territory of Northern Serbia uh, at the late uh, 19th century. And in the National History Museum in Budapest in, uh, in Hungary, they have material deposited and originated from Serbia. But in our National History Museum in Belgrade in Serbia, we have just a few specimens from these specific habitat types. So data, uh, data collected by Geza Horvet were our starting point. So uh, through our projects, uh, we want to investigate what is actually the current fauna of saline grasslands and saline habitats in general in northern Serbia? And later we developed from the uh, next project uh, and more oriented our projects to ecological uh, uh, kind of studies. Also, all our projects were supported uh, by the Rafa Foundation. It's a UK based foundation uh, which mostly, mostly support uh, young conservationists and mostly those which work in NGOs. Uh, in third world countries. So we have a, a lack that in Serbia is still not a part of um, European Union. So we can get that kind, this kind of support from the Rafa Foundation. And want to emphasize uh, that through our project, we visited more than 100 sites and sampling uh, locations and sampling sites in Serbia uh, from which we collected this very valuable uh, biological material. Our research ob objectives for our, uh, in our projects were to inventory the fauna uh, of saline grasslands and saline habitats in Serbia and to see what is the distribution of saline specialists. We also want to form a list of uh, candidates uh, which can be uh, proposed for a future red list of true bugs of Serbia. And also uh, we tried to, to investigate and to explore how actually uh, this data on fauna of true bugs can be used for monitoring of saline grasslands and in future some other types of uh, grasslands. And want to see, we also want to see what the ecological factors actually shape those true bug communities. Uh, according to actually uh, proposition of those uh, rougher projects, we also have some activities which are not uh, which were not scientific so we worked a lot on popularization of entomology among biology and ecology students we want to actually broaden our team of true bug specialists uh, which can continue to work on true bug uh, projects outside of those projects on selling grasslands so we want to actually recruit uh, new students which can uh, be equipped with the knowledge uh, on the true bug taxonomy and true bug fauna in, uh, in Serbia, and which can develop their own ideas and projects on, on true bugs. We also uh, work on raising awareness um, and to emphasize how important are those habitats and their biodiversity uh, in, in, in our country. So, um, the results of our research uh, were that we actually in total collected 231 species of true bugs and 210 species are terrestrial. Uh, like I said, uh, our first project was actually focusing on all, uh, we're not focused on any kind of habitat type. We just looked for, uh, we collected from any, any uh, saline habitats, also marshlands and uh, saline uh, lakes. But later we focused on terrestrial habitats, specifically on those saline grasslands and pastures mostly. Uh, on the right, you can see the uh, Hydrometra gracilenta. It's a species uh, which is very, it's a very rare species in Europe. It's an um, amphibian true bug. Um, and besides this one, we also uh, had uh, seven more uh, new records for Serbian fauna and they are listed here. 
Um, besides those new uh, species for our fauna, we also uh, have uh, we also had uh, seven rediscoveries, and four of those seven species are actually rediscovered more than a century after more than a century. And uh, like I said, we want to explore also the distribution of saline specialists. Saline specialists were considered uh, as a species which are related only with these habitat sites, uh, uh, habitat types in our country. And uh, those saline specialists are actually uh, divided into three groups. We had the uh, trophic specialists, those are Solenopsifus, sorry, uh, B, uh, B uh, picture and F picture. Those are Solenopsifus, Fuscovenosus, and Antiminia varicornis. Those tropical specialists are related with the specific host plant. Their host plants are actually halophytes, so plants highly adapted to saline soils and saline habitats. The other group are consist of Ponostetus hungaricus. Uh, and Henestaris halophilus, those are uh, species on the photo A and C. Uh, they are not tropically related with any specific host plant, but they, can, they are specific for certain habitat type and certain uh, vegetation type. So if you can recognize by the, by the characteristic plant species, the habitat, you will find those species there as well. And they are very numerous in uh, saline habitats. The third group of saline specialists are actually species, um, Peritre uh, Peritrechus meridionalis, which is not represented here. We don't have a photo of it. Uh, then Ligiosoma anatolicum on B photo and on the G photo, Crispinus angustatus. Those three species are actually species related with saline habitat in this region. So outside of this region, they're also related with saline habitat, but of different types. They can be, uh, they can be found in um, coastal uh, vegetation of uh, Black Sea and Mediterranean Sea. So are, those are the, the closest what we get here in inland, uh, inland saline grassland. So um, besides those saline specialists, uh, we want to uh, propose the list of uh, future uh, true bugs, uh, uh, future uh, candidates of true bugs, which can be uh, uh, which can be presented in uh, national red list of uh, true bugs. So, besides saline specialists, we involve here all species which have some kind of conservation status by IUCN evaluation in other in other Pannonian countries. But unfortunately, Hungary and Serbia, we don't have a national. Uh, red list. So any of those species listed here are uh, already protected or present in any kind of uh, highly protected species list in my country or, or Hungary. Also, uh, we want to involve in this uh, list uh, rare species. Species uh, we uh, considered and defined as rare, uh, as rare are those with the maximum three records in Serbia by now outside of saline habitats too. So everyone in Serbia, if they were recorded less than, more than uh, maximum three times, they are considered as rare. And we had uh, 12 of those species uh, we recorded in our uh, saline habitat and uh, which can be considered as a candidates for a red list in future. So uh, why true bugs are potentially good by indicators. Like I mentioned before, uh, they are highly numerous, they are very diverse in saline grasslands, and uh, by this that means that they, uh, they represent a very important food source for many predatory invertebrates, but also small vertebrates. So they have an important role in food webs too. They, uh, by their uh, fauna and uh, community structure, they can give us information about the quality and out of the vegetation and habitat. And like I said, any change in habitat, especially if it involves in veg uh, vegetation, these uh, communities respond very fast. Also in these habitat types where we don't have many flowering plants and flowers are very scarce. We don't have a poll pollinators. I mean, pollinators are present usually in the spring season, but they are very, very um, just present with a few species. 
So we need uh, to involve a new bioindicators which can represent actually diversity uh, of those habitats. Also collecting methods for true bugs are very easy and very, very um, uh, cheap actually to conduct. To conduct. So we have a sweeping net, um, uh, sweep netting, sorry, as a alternative uh, collecting method, which is very, very uh, appropriate for this kind of habitats because here uh, grass is not so dense, not so tall, so uh, nets are working very fine. We also rarely have bushes and trees in those habitats. We don't have to imply, actually apply some extra um, sampling methods like beating from these kinds of vegetation. So sweet netting is totally enough to, to apply here. So we want to, through some small analysis, we try to, to see what ecological factors in general shape those uh, true bugs communities. So we can see on those graphs on the right, actually how seasonality can influence species richness and evidence of true bugs. We can see that May is the, uh, the month in, the, in which diversity of true bugs in those habitats actually is the richest. So in May, why is that? Because uh, in May, uh, we have those grasslands are flourishing with uh, diversity of plant species and the grasses are still fresh. So a lot of grass feeders are present only in those few uh, weeks in May and sometimes in early June. Later in season, actually those grasslands are drying out and uh, it, those food sources are unavailable anymore. And most of grass feeders, especially through bug species, uh, species uh, disappear uh, uh, in the rest of the season. Also some tropical specialists, saline specialists are present in springtime and there are uh, one species like uh, Solenoxifus fuscovenosus. We, we, we saw the photo of that, of that species before. That species is actually characteristically Aut autumnal, uh, uh, fall species, autumnal, uh, autumnal species, sorry. Also, we can see on these graphs on the left that by uh, that dissimilarity among sampling sites was um, higher uh, in the early season in May than later in season when actually uh, fauna is very reduced. And for example, in June, uh, in July, sorry, in July, you can see the lowest number of species is present and those sampling sites are more similar to each other in this month. Also, we tried to analyze how landscape uh, factors and habitat factors actually can influence uh, Juba communities. So we measured a landscape uh, heterogeneity uh, by um, uh, involved the uh, Shannon Biodiversity Index, which is usually used to calculate uh, diversity in certain uh, group of uh, plants or animals. But in this case, we use the percentage of um, percentage of um, sorry of uh, landscape cover um, as a measure of abundance or. Yeah, the measure of abundance and to calculate how diverse is and heterogeneous is actually landscape in those buffer zones around the sampling point. Sampling points is here represented in the center of the circles. And uh, we can see later how those uh, landscape factors like um, percentage of arable land, sorry, like percentage of arable land and uh, heterogeneity of landscape, how they can influence the species richness mostly of true bugs, but also management. So on habitat level, uh, we have also a very important um, influence to species richness. Uh, what is also a uh, characteristic of true, bugs commu uh, true bug communities in those grasslands is their nestedness. Nested uh, community structure uh, can be represented by those graphs actually where the habitats are like islands in the in the sea where the island uh, which is the closest to the mainland actually have the highest number of species and how we are going further from the mainland the next islands have a, a, a smaller set of species and all those 
a smaller set of species are actually represented as a subset of the um, of uh, the previous islands. So, in, sorry. So we can see, sorry, we can see on this graph actually how uh, sites are represented in rows and species in columns. So we can see the sites with the lowest number of species and they are subsets of, uh, the, of the next uh, sites with the higher number of species. This is taken actually from the theory of island biogeography, like I mentioned, where fragmented habitats are uh, observed as um, archipelagos in uh, oceans. So what are the main causes of this nested structure? Uh, we, we published one paper on that, and actually we, we, uh, get, uh, we get to the conclusion that habitat heterogeneity is the main cause of it. So if we have a more heterogeneous habitat, and uh, more microhabitats in, uh, in, in this area. That means that more sources uh, can provide more species present there. So fauna is richer in uh, more heterogeneous habitat. And um, in that sense, if we have a smaller fragment of the grassland plant uh, habitat with uh, very rich resources, we don't need that huge uh, habitat area. And now how this knowledge and how this analysis can be applied for a, uh, in conservation, it depends what are our conservation goals. Uh, by, but by this analysis, we can recognize what habitat fragments are the richest in species and what habitat fragments are richest actually in um, microhabitats and resources. And, but if our conservation goal is actually to preserve the most specific and very peculiar resources and species, then we can see it also from this analysis. So uh, in our, in uh, our actually project, uh, projects, we had also beside those faunal, um, uh, faunal research, we have the some small uh, ecological uh, research studies too. And we had this uh, grazing experiment. Mm, we just collected data, sorry, but we, we, we still have to process those, uh, this material. So the idea was to see how communities of uh, saline grasslands actually change with the cutting of grass. So how, sorry, how removal of vegetation in those plots, 30 times 30 meters plots. So how remove vegetation influence Tuba communities. Outside area is unmoved, untouched. So we sampled from uh, moon areas, from cut parts, and also outside where the grass was not cut. And we want to say what are the differences in those communities. We also installed uh, ambiental data loggers in those sampling sites. Every time before we sampled, we put them like 24 hours before sampling to measure local humidity and um, uh, temperature in those microhabitat actually climate. We sampled uh, monthly from June to September and we move, uh, we move actually our plots in May before we start sampling. The second, the second study was dealing with the rapid biodiversity assessment of saline pastures. Uh, we designed protocol uh, which will provide us with information uh, which can be used tomorrow in conservation practice and uh, management planning. So we want to have an efficient protocol which uh, we can apply in future. Uh, this uh, rapid biodiversity assessment was, uh, was based on taxon uh, focusing approach where we have a focal taxa, actually surrogate, which were surrogates for the whole group. So we, um, we actually uh, had the, we selected eight species of two bugs, uh, very easily recognizable eight species, which uh, were surrogates for the whole uh, two, bug, uh, two bug fauna in those habitats. So what were the criteria uh, for choosing uh, and selection of those two bugs? Actually, all those species have to be easily recognizable in the field. We didn't want to, um, to collect material, kill those specimens and take to the lab. We want to uh, be in involved only species we, uh, which we could recognize easily in the field and to separate what are the names, what are the others uh, and count them uh, on the spot. Also, 
those most of those species are like i mentioned before mostly saline specialists but also all those species have a certain conservation status in uh, uh, other Pannonian countries. Also, uh, we, had to kn- we had to know in advance what are the host plants and what vegetation type we can find those species. So we were targetly looking for specific um, vegetation and host plants to collect those uh, species. And also uh, we had to know the season when adults occur, uh, occur those, uh, when adults of those species occur actually in the habitat. Uh, besides those uh, species uh, data, we also collect the data on vegetation, threatening factors, and management. So, like I mentioned, um, we did also some kind of non scientific work in our project. So, we gave a lot of oral presentation uh, to biology students, to elementary school kids, to general public. We published a lot of popular science articles in uh, local uh, newspapers, magazines, Serbian newspapers also. And uh, for every of our project, we also publish some kind of um, some kind of uh, printed material. So we have a le- uh, leaflet from our first project, from our second project. We had this uh, poster on saline, uh, the most common saline, um, uh, sorry, specialist. And from our third project, we have this small brochure in Serbian also. Um, Like I mentioned, the the, the main uh, goal of those um, publications are actually to uh, inform general public about our our work. We also had a a cooperation with the one student society from University of Novi Sad in Serbia. They had a Wikipedia project and they wrote like 50, uh, 50 articles related to saline grasslands and to saline uh, species. Uh, the most important outcomes of our project are that we collected valuable fauna data. We have a new uh, species for national fauna. We have uh, several uh, discoveries. And also I can say freely that these saline grasslands are now one of the, the best uh, studied habitat types in Serbia. Uh, we collected crisis biological material, and we are planning to uh, deposit it in the National History Museum. This is the photo from my collection. I have a four, five boxes, I think, of, uh, of true bugs collected from saline habitats in Serbia, but have to deal with the labels. It's a, a very uh, huge work, but hopefully we'll have, we'll have fine, uh, fine time uh, soon for that. Anyway, we also collected a lot of uh, ecologically important data, uh, on which we can base our future studies and hope we, it can be helpful for conservation and uh, management planning. Um, also, our data uh, were used for um, master thesis. My colleague, Gwena Nadezhdin, who worked with me on those projects, she actually worked, uh, she, she actually based her master thesis on the data we collected on those selling grasslands. And my PhD thesis is also uh, Part of my PhD thesis also involved this data and those research in, in Serbian uh, saline grasslands. We, we attract huge public attention, and my colleague and I are recognized now as a true bug uh, team, and we hope that new members will uh, join us in, in soon future. Just a few words uh, I will tell you about my uh, studies in Hungary. Uh, like I said, I'm a PhD student in, at the University of Szeged in Hungary. So I will just give you a clue what I was doing there actually for my PhD. So the first study was dealing with the um, uh, assessment of uh, saline uh, grassland management by grazing. So we have those installed, um, uh, those, uh, sorry, ungrazed plots and the surrounding area was grazed uh, by a great Hungarian co- uh, cattle. It's a local breed of cattle. So we have those plots installed in different two, two different types of saline grasslands. We also have a, two different types of collect, uh, sampling methods with swift netting to collect actually plant dwelling fauna. And also for ground dwellers, we have the pitfall trapping. And we also analyze adults and nymphs. And we want to say what uh, want to see actually what are uh, what were what are the responses of true bug communities, different parts of true bug communities, to 
to, to the management. The second study was dealing with the drainage, uh, drainage canals in, um, uh, on saline soils and to see how those secondary habitats can serve in conservation of saline, uh, saline grassland toolbags. So we have uh, those canals which were crossing grassland, saline grassland, and uh, this, kind, this type of canals are represented here. And the second part of uh, the second type of canals were agrarian canals. So the canals on salty soils, but, but bordering uh, cropland. And we want to see how canal, uh, canal uh, characteristics and attributes actually can um, relate to certain functional and life history traits of true bugs and what part of uh, fauna from saline grassland, uh, saline grassland they can uh, well support. So uh, this was my presentation. I hope you uh, could understand and enjoy a bit in it. And um, uh, those are a few, uh, few photos, more few photos from saline grasslands in Serbia. And that was it. Thank you for your attention. So a uh, very interesting talk, uh, Yelena, and um, to all our audience uh, participating here, uh, please uh, drop in your questions on the chat box so that we could uh, uh, read them. So it's fairly interesting, you know, uh, uh, to know that the silent soils in uh, Serbia have been caused by, you know, flood plains depositing salt from uh, mountains. Uh, I've, yes. I've, I think I've heard of, uh, or probably watch of a, uh, a movie that uh, most of the mountains there were being mined for, uh, you know, salt. Basically, I don't know if it's is, is it for table salt or for other kinds of salt. Different kinds of salt. Oh, I see. Different okay. kinds of salt. Uh, in the Philippines, most of our saline soils are, uh, you know, are caused by salt water intrusions from coastal areas, and um, but we still have rice producing areas in some of our uh, provinces, mm -hmm. like. Um, there's one in Bulacan, in Cagayan, and the Bicol region. There are, uh, there, there are some areas that have been uh, planted rice. There are rice producing areas. Uh -huh. And I think uh, it, will be, uh, it will be good to know if there are you know, also true bugs there. And um, how do they compare to the Serbian ones in terms of adaptation to salinity? Yeah, 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 yeah. You can you can probably do something like that. There are specific plants, uh, sorry, uh, true bug species which are related with the coastal uh, mm -hmm. saline habitats in Europe too. But uh, most of those species and communities are a, a bit different than those inland. All right, okay. And uh, I I have no idea if there are right if there are saline uh, specialist insects in the Philippines right now. Uh, I'm not an entomologist, I guess. If there are, uh, if some of you are participants here, uh, do know of one, of one or two, please uh, let us know in the chat box. It probably could let us know. So um, the open forum is uh, open. Please uh, put your questions there in the chat box if you have questions for Yelena. All right, so we'll be waiting. Uh, if those on YouTube, uh, please uh, could uh, let me just check our, our YouTube channel. Okay. If there are questions on the, the comment section. Uh, but I have a, a question here. Um, how yes. do you measure the, I've seen in your presentation that you've mentioned that uh, the true bugs there have a, have a very quick response to the change in the environment. So, um, so in order to use true bugs uh, as bioindicators, what are the, you know, the methods that you use, the, the, uh, the analysis that you use for, for, for them to be useful as bioindicators? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we can see it by the change uh, in community structure, actually, and the species and fauna which are present or not present. Uh, when we have a change in a habitat, for example, by removing the vegetation, that removal of vegetation immediately destroyed the structure of that mm -hmm. habitat. So a lot of species which are uh, plant dwellers, they will move from that habitat immediately. So we will just record the absence of those species, for example, or their abundance will be lower. 
So in that mm -hmm. sense, they are being bioindicators. Right. And also uh, we can observe the change in some functional traits, some average, um, uh, average, um, average, uh, sorry, um, functional trait attributes. For example, we will have a less dispersed species present in those habitats which are highly disturbed. Mostly ground dwellers, which are not very good flyers, for example, or species with a bigger body size will be present in highly disturbed habitats or something like that. We can measure those traits. So um, when you say you were talking about environmental changes, were, were, were you concentrating on salinity uh, only no. or you were talking of like temperature and the humidity yeah. and others? So we actually, uh, I just started with those uh, micro environmental, uh, micro uh, climate changes with the measuring temperature and humidity, because obviously when you remove vegetation and destroy the vegetation, you will have a change. You will have a microclimate drier and mm -hmm. less humid and so on. So we expect, expect different species also present when the change, uh, with the changed microclimate. Uh, we have we, we have it's not a question but it's a message from uh, Christian Lucanius okay. who's a, a junior entomologist here. Um, there are saltwater species of water striders here in the Philippines, yes. and uh, they are mostly coastal species. Mm -hmm. um, and they are some and some are can be found on the open ocean. I, I don't yes. think you've. Um, I don't. I, I haven't seen a water strider in the open ocean yet. <laughs> yes, yes. I think uh, your colleague is, uh, thinks about the Halobates genus. Mm. I know that we don't have it in Europe, but they, those are open waters uh, water striders, and they can be observed like uh, kilometers. I mean, many kilometers far away from the from the coast, so they are on open oceans. Yeah, 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 yeah. And how do they, you know, uh, survive? Eat, eat, yeah, uh, yeah. survive like. Would they uh, every night they, you, they'll go home? <laughs> as I, I mean, I don't know much about that group, but as I know, they are mostly scavenging. Like there are scavengers on the top of the water. There are always some kind of particles of dead bodies or dead yeah, tissues, yeah. something. So they are fed on those, mm. and also they are floating basically on the on the water surface. They also put their they. Um, I think they are oviposit their eggs also on some floating objects. So they, they never are submerged to, to the water. They survive on the open sea all the time. As uh, I know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <don't My> <laughs> all right. Um, I have another question here. Um, yeah. although, you, although you're still gathering data on the, you know, your project, grass cuttings as an yeah. alternative, uh, grass cutting as an alternative to grazing, um, do you have any initial uh, findings or inferences about what what are you going to expect? Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, like I mentioned, I uh, we expect that with the management uh, and the less less structured habitats, how we use the this, this vegetation, that we will have um, uh, less diverse uh, communities, so less species present. Also, that those communities will be mostly drought adapted, mm -hmm. and uh, that they are probably, like I mentioned, less dispersive, or even to expect more uh, invasive species and more uh, generalist type of species, less specialist in those disturbed habitats. Right, and um, you mentioned earlier your um, you're using um, the true bugs as. Uh... Uh, what you call this uh, for rapid biodiversity assessment. Yes. So, uh, do you think uh, uh, your that methodology, the one that you've shown in the picture, uh, can it be easily adapted to uh, other possible insect indicators? Probably yes. Mm -hmm. If you have a good knowledge on fauna, mm -hmm. local fauna, on that group, and if you can identify those species easily. I mean, but you need the experts sometimes. Uh, it depends on the group, actually. You know that a lot of citizen science actually can do this kind of job if they are very knowledgeable about butterfly 
a fauna yeah. or a um, dragonfly fauna. So even not experts can do this kind of um, assessment if they are knowledgeable about the local fauna and the species present there. Right. Um, I'm not quite familiar about, um, you know, <laughs> targeted taxons uh, being used for uh, a biodiversity uh -huh. assessment or because on based on my work here at the, the museum, I'm just used to uh, seeing people um, doing the general, the very basic biodiversity assessment, just seeing what's uh, what's out there and uh, uh, what uh, what can be seen. Yeah, it's actually very useful, especially for some very sensitive butterflies. Mm -hmm. So butterfly species are excellent for using this kind of assessments. And you've stated earlier that uh, you have eight uh, true bugs which you use for yeah. bioindicators, do they have to be like present all the time or for example, no, no. just one and then you use that for your uh, indicator? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Would so there be we a actually, possibility that you'll have more in the future? Uh, in what sense more? Uh, more more true species? bugs as uh, more true bugs that will be included uh, as, a, as, a, as part of your indicator group. Yeah, why not? But uh, we chose those species which, uh, because they are very easily recognizable. They are big enough, for example. We cannot choose some very small species like two or three millimeters long, right. uh, which we cannot identify, I mean, without uh, microscopes, stereo microscopes. So we need something bigger, um, very easily recognizable with some very characteristic morphological features we can observe by our bare eyes. So that was the, the, the actually logic of uh, our target species we, we used. All right. Okay. So I'm soliciting uh, more questions from the audience. Okay. I think you're, all of you are shy. <laughs> Please try to, uh, <laughs> yeah, to engage with uh, Yelena. So I'll be uh, uh, have setting for uh, probably uh, two or more if you are interested to throw a question or two. Of course. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, what else can you ask, uh, Yelena? Um, well, do you have rice there? Rice. <laughs> rice. No. Do, do you grow rice? Because um, you know, when you talk of grasslands, uh, I'm you sure that rice. grasslands here are different, and uh, I'm not sure about uh, what what kind of grass uh, are you talking about in. Uh, uh huh. So uh, rice fields are not so common, at least mm -hmm. in, in my country. I, I never saw rice field in my country. So <laughs> I, 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 I don't have experience, so I don't know how it looks like actually. So I'm talking here mostly about semi-natural grasslands, which are used as um, uh, moving meadows or uh, as a pastures. So not much uh, rice fields, right. but as I know in Hungary, at the beginning, I, I think in the middle of 20th century, like in 50s or 60s, they have some kind of project on national level to raise rice. Right. Okay. But I'm not sure that it was successful. I also never observed in Hungary rice fields. So. But do you have uh, you have natural pastures, but you also have um, uh, it's like a commercial cultivation for uh, forage materials. Do, do you have that? Or is we it like have, naturally, naturally uh, occurring? Not naturally occurring, but yeah, people are planting certain uh, forage for, uh, for cattle, for example. But mostly, I think in my country, uh, pastures are still rich in grasses, so they don't have to be like cultivated or, or something. I know that in Germany, they, for example, use fertile they fertilize their like pastures it. or something like that. But I never heard that something like that was in, 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 applied in Serbia. Would you think that the uh, application of like, um, you know, if, if there will be a time for a commercial cultivation of forage, uh, you know, the application of fertilizers or possibly mm -hmm. insecticides, would that be, uh, uh, no, I know, would that have like an effect, a very, a uh, negative effect on terms of, you know, your diversity? Uh, probably, yes. Um, I follow actually some of those studies in Germany where they have those highly cultivated grasslands. 
And I think they observe uh, less diverse communities, especially specifically of true bugs, because I was following those studies on true bugs. Yeah, they have those um, highly uh, less diverse and the fauna is very actually uh, scarce there and very um, not very interesting. Just general species Just general are present species. here. So. Mm. Um. I'm curious whether there is a difference in uh, the grass composition. Um, uh, like those that are located near rivers, as you mentioned, because uh, some of the steps there are have been floodplains, and yeah. those which are uh, possibly higher up in, elev in elevation, are there differences and if there are differences in the vegetation in the grass composition uh, are there differences also in the uh, insect uh, communities yes actually those uh, steps which are on higher elevation which are not considered as a salty for example which are not on salty soils those are the richest and the most precious especially sand grasslands we have sand grasslands also, uh, mm -hmm. sand steps actually here in this region. And those are the of the highest priority for conservation. They are, um, they are actually have the uh, highest species riches in plants, in insects, in uh, vertebrates and all other possible groups. So sand areas are the considered as the most precious because um, if they, if if there is any kind of a destruction or a change in their um, ecological, uh, how to say, environment, uh, those are irrever irreversible actually changes. But in saline grasslands, those are the tough ones of habitat, let's say. So they are used to be grazed, trampled, they are used to be devastated, mm -hmm. but that salinity and this water will always bring the uh, habitat, if we have the, those naturally occurring, um, how to say, ecological processes and phenomena, yeah. mm -hmm. we will have always uh, those grasslands and this vegetation present there. But with the sand grasslands, the problem, I think, with the step, uh, steps on sands, if their soil microbiome is destructed by fertilizers or pesticides, yeah you cannot uh, bring it back actually. I see, okay. Um, we have a, uh, yay, we have one question here from Diane Rennie's uh, Java and uh, she's still a student and uh, she's not quite familiar with, uh, with insects. But her mm -hmm. question is, uh, are there possibilities for the true bugs that you have mentioned to infest, uh, uh, infest and cause damage to other habitats? <laughs> Those true bugs I was talking about, no, because mm. they are habitat specific. So right. rarely they will go to another habitat because they don't have a food force there. So yeah, some general species are present in saline grasslands too, and some of them are considered as a agricultural pest, but their abundance is very low. So they're not uh, so important in, for local croplands, for example probably they, their numbers are much higher in the local crop, crop, lots, uh, crop land, so. But um, I'm, I'm interested to know, um, are there um, instances or studies that um, they have seen that uh, some insects are not very, not specific to saline soils, uh, start to intrude or uh, become invasive pests on that uh, specific uh, habitat? Are there uh, 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 I have like knowledge, that? I have a knowledge only about, I think, two aquatic true bug species, mm -hmm. which bec uh, became, those are allochthonous species, and I think they're um, from Northern America or something like that. So they're invading those uh, coastal areas of Europe or Southern Europe, and also one species we have um, highly present in those uh, salt lakes in Hungary and Serbia. Uh, right. That is Mediterranean Sea, difficult species, but now it's inland too. So do you think they will become, you know, uh, later on adapted, adapted to saline uh, environments? I'm not sure because uh, saline habitats are very extreme. 
uh, very extreme habitats. And I think that amount of drought and the dryness, uh, it's not very uh, pleasant habitat for most of the species. They will look for something more subtle, for something more humid type of habitats or grasslands maybe, if we are expecting some invasives. But most of our invasives are in urban areas. Urban. And they are related with the greenery of the urban areas. Okay. Our second question from our okay. audience is from Dino Pabilico. Uh, he's a biology student from UP Manila, and uh, he's asking, what are, uh, what are the parameters to consider for habitat suitability assessment uh, of true bugs, possibly uh, specifically uh, on saline soils, and maybe if, if there's a general, uh, general perspective, maybe you can, do, you can say that. I'm not sure what is the question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, again, what are what what are your parameters? What are the parameters to consider uh, for habitat suitability assessment suitability. Um, for true bugs? Uh -huh. Like? Uh -huh. Okay, okay. So what I consider as a suitable saline grassland habitat. So there are specific one species which only can thrive on salt soils. So on, based on this vegetation, I can actually recognize the uh, proper habitat type. And if we sample true bugs in those habitats, we will see that we will find or not find some uh, saline specific related true bugs. So vegetation is the, actually the key. And uh, do you have like a, a host specific uh, true bugs? That, that yes. they won't go to other grassland species? Yes, yes. Okay. I mentioned those uh, trophic specialists. So those species are, uh, those two species I, I mentioned in my presentation, I can show you the, 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 the photos. They are related with the specific halophytes. So plants mm -hmm. which are adapted to uh, salt habitat and salt soils. And they are feed on, only on them. When you see the host plant, when you find the host plant, you will find the bug immediately. <laughs> you don't have to look anywhere else. And if you try to find it somewhere else, by my experience, um, I, I never found those tropical, trophic specialists outside of their host plant. All right. Okay. So um, do you have more questions uh, for Yelena? I'll be waiting for uh, the last one before we conclude. Right, and uh, let me just uh, put in here the chat box, the link to our evaluation form. So I'll be counting uh, up to ten. If you don't have any further questions, we will be ending the open po uh, open forum, and then we will proceed to the uh, closing program. So again, I'm posting here the link to the uh, evaluation form if you want to. Uh, get a certificate of attendance please uh, click on that so i guess there's no more uh, questions from our audience um again thank you yelena for that uh, uh very interesting uh, presentation it's uh and it's nice to see other you know presentations coming from uh, the different parts of the globe and uh, we thank you for um you know accepting our invitation to be our guest speaker for our biodiversity seminar today it was my pleasure to give this lecture. I hope uh, I can I can uh, help. <laughs> I can give an, an, some uh, similar similar presentation in future. Yes, in the future. Yeah. And for those the audiences who are uh, kind of shy, if you want to uh, email uh, Yelena in the future, of you know, if, you're, if you want to ask um, some questions, or maybe you're interested in studying in uh, the University of Szeged in in Hungary <laughs> or in Serbia, yes. just yeah, maybe uh, Yelena can uh, share her email address. I will, I will give you my email, actually. I will share my email so you can uh, write me on this email. I will uh, All right. for who would like to reply. All right. And while she's doing that, let me just uh, share my screen. Finally, uh, on behalf of our uh, director, let me um, share. Uh, give this uh, certificate of appreciation to our speaker Yelena and it reads okay. certificate of appreciation is awarded to Yelena Chiet 
for uh, serving as resource person during the UPLB Museum of Natural History Biodiversity Seminar on True Bugs of Central European Saline Grasslands held uh, 21 of April 2022 from 3 to 4.30 p.m. via Zoom and it's signed by our director, Dr. Marian B. De Leon. So congratulations, Yelena, and outstanding yeah, presentation. Thank you once more. Good luck to your uh, research endeavors. Finally, um, please, if you're interested, uh, just visit our website. It's uh, mnh.uplb.edu.ph. Uh, you can email us at mnh.uplb at up.edu.ph. We have a lot of um, social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, and Instagram. Just like, follow, subscribe us using the uh, look for the handle UPLB Museum and check out our articles at Wikipedia and Trip Advisor. All right. So again, thank you very much to all our participants. Our next um, webinar, I think, will be on uh, possibly two weeks from now, and we will have an ant ecologist, Dr. Diana Gilon, as our speaker. So please stay tuned to our uh, uh, Facebook um, account, Facebook page, and uh, just wait for our announcement. So maraming salamat po and keep safe. Thank you very much, Yelena. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.